County and we'll be getting to hear the latest from uh, Chris Thairu. From now, though, I want to go back to that uh, uh, highlight that I had just made a few moments ago about the killings that we're seeing. There, We're talking about the rising cases of police officers who are committing suicide and killing their colleagues. The latest case, like I mentioned, uh, was that suicide committed by the administration police attached to Takaungu AP post in Kilifi. He turned his G3 rifle on himself while on night patrol duty with a colleague. Another officer from Baringo is still at large after he shot dead two of his colleagues and injured another in Baringo County in unclear circumstances. All right, so we want to have a conversation here in studio uh, with a panel of guests. Joining me right now is Richard Tuta. He is an expert in Homeland Security. Thank you very much for joining us. And we also have George Msamali, a regular here on News Center. Thank you very much. He is a security expert. All right, so does this, does, does this rise in cases of uh, suicide in you know, our police force worry you in any way? I'll start with you, Richard. Uh, really, if you look at uh, the, the numbers, mm -hmm the numbers vis-a-vis -vis the, 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 the total number of police mm -hmm. officers that we have, mm -hmm. because that one is maybe zero point something percent yes. of the total number of the police officers that we have in the country. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it from that angle, mm -hmm. then it should not worry. But at the same time, a life regardless of whose life is precious. So it is also can be looked from the angle that it is an indicator mm -hmm. of a collapse somewhere within the, 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 the police system both from an individual perspective as a police officer and the systemic, uh, okay. the entire structure of the police mm -hmm. in terms of their commanders, how they relate to their juniors. All right. So those are some of the indica uh, indicators okay. of what is happening. Indicators. All right, George, does this, um, is this, you know, just one of the things that, you know, we talk about stress in any, you know, part of society, it could be anybody. Are we overthinking these suicide cases or is it something that we should be talking and worrying about? Betty, this is something we should be talking and worrying about mm -hmm. because uh, it's very unfortunate that it's happening in 2017. I'd like to go back to history when I was in service. 1990-95, uh, an officer I was serving with in the GSUC company, uh, we used to call him Bakora, mm -hmm. did the same thing. He went to marketplace in Takwell, shot dead five people, and then committed suicide. He killed himself. Mm -hmm. We moved from Takwell, went to Mombasa. The same thing happened. Rocket also went to on Mombasa uh, in Salambo, in Mombasa. Mm -hmm. He shot dead revealers in the in the club, and also killed himself. I mean, if that was happening in the 90s, and we're still witnessing the same trend in 2017, it means there's something that we're not doing right. Mm -hmm. We should accept that policemen and police women are human beings and there's a level of stress. Remember, these are people in a position of authority. These are people who can make decisions about life and death. Mm -hmm. And then when they are suffering from stress, it goes unrecognized, it goes unacknowledged. Mm -hmm. And I think we should blame this squarely on the police management because this stress is work-related, mm -hmm. that is one, and then there's that at the individual level. Right. So are we researching on this? Because uh, it's not normal for a policeman to turn his gun against himself, mm -hmm. turn his gun against his colleagues. For example, the Baringo case, yes. this is a person that had just come from leave, from off. So what happened while he was away? Mm -hmm. Is it something that is related to the family? You see, the kind of management witness in the police, you move people within three years. This is a family person. We have kids. He has kids. Yes. For example, right now as we speak, members of the police band have been told to move from South B to Ruiru. And the management is not looking at a person who is, uh, has a family. Mm. Children are going to school around here. Mm. So what do you expect is happening in the mind of that police All officer? Right. So right. I think this is management related mm -hmm. and we should also try and audit the individual lives of these police officers. Right. I think this is something serious. It's interesting that you say that because my, my next question is to come from, you know, the sort of frustrations that we've seen our police you know be or live under if it's you know the, the, the sort of like lives they leave their houses where they live it's a conversation that we've been having for such a long time could it be you know so, uh, uh, an enabler to what's happening I, I, I think what we are uh, we are going through as a country mm -hmm. is what uh, in Swahili somebody will will argue that mm -hmm. uh, are we talking about police Bora or Bora policy mm -hmm. because are we talking are we talking about uh, quality or are we talking about quantity? Okay. Uh, remember up to the 19th century, there was introduced a new concept both in the military and in the police, mm -hmm. which is called revolution in military affairs. Revolution in military affairs is aimed at having a quali 
quantitative, qualitative mm -hmm. advantage of our other criminals. But what we are experiencing as a country is that we are so much focused into the number of police officers. Yes. We are not keen on to how do we improve their working environment, how do we improve their weapons, how do we improve their structure, mm -hmm. how do we improve their, uh, their training. In fact, we rather have a lean and lethal uh, police force than to have uh, quite a number of maybe we are talking of uh, every year we are talking yeah. of increasing the number the by number. this. But are we prepared? Are we prepared in terms of resources? Mm -hmm. as, are we prepared as a country in terms mm -hmm. of uh, operating environment? Because mm -hmm. like for instance, if you look at the, the two cases that you have talked yes. about, the Khalifi case, mm -hmm. the Khalifi case can be a case of an individual, okay. which now requires those who are in charge of the police to look at to the issue of recruiting. Because what I understand is that when you decide to become a police officer, you must have very high breaking point. You are not just like somebody on mm. the, a pedestrian on the street. Mm. You should have a very high breaking point. Mm. So the moment a police officer, because of what my, my colleague is talking about, because of job-related distress, can turn a gun on himself, then it brings about the question, how did this person at the first place end up becoming a police officer? Okay. How was he trained mm. so that he can handle all this pressure that comes with the nature of his work. So it starts even from the training of this? From it the starts training. from the training. Okay. The second point, like the issue of what happened in Baringo, mm. this brings to the question, how are, they, how are the police commanders recruited? How are they trained? Do they have aspects of management? Do, how do they look at their juniors? Because the days of uh, that I am a senior police officer, that I issue a command regardless and you have to do yes. it, we, the commanders now have to go undergo a specialized training mm -hmm. that, yes, I am a commander. There is that which I should treat my officers as colleagues, not as a subject. Okay. Because the moment with all the stress and the terrains wherever an officer is operating from, and you end up treating him as a, as a, as a subordinate, that is why they are behaving the way they are behaving. All right. Yes. Uh, Mr. Mali, I'd like us to talk about the state of... Uh, you know, the Kenyan police officer right now, have their lives improved? And we're even analyzing, you know, what the Jubilee government have, has done so far in regards to, um, you know, security and investing in our forces. What is the current situation when you talk about, you know, the, a wholesome police officer? Where are we at? I think we're not yet out of the woods, Betty, mm -hmm. because uh, things are still the same. When you're recruited in the police, you're promised so much. For example, when you get in, you're told you'll be housed. Yes. Unfortunately, we are accommodating our police officers. That environment itself will stress you. Living in the same family unit, two families, you have your wife, you have your kids, mm. you're sharing the same house. I think that one we've not moved any far. We talked about uh, giving them equipment. We went and bought uh, APCs. Mm -hmm that are actually also stressing the police officers. What I know is that right what now... What are APCs for the... <laughs> uh, uh, armored personnel carriers. Okay. You saw what happened yes, in Lambo. Yes, yes, yes. And then we were told, like, uh, these things were not uh, suitable for that kind of terrain. They were not suitable for that kind of duty. Mm. And then you are being forced to use the same vehicle. You don't have faith in it. Mm. Automatically, that is going to stress you. It's going to mm. interfere with your brains. Yes. And I think we have given them vehicles. But we've not looked at the individual welfare of the police officers. We are not paying them allowances while out there in operations. Mm -hmm. This is a badly kept secret, and this is the reason why you'll find that people are killing themselves in uh, operational areas. There are no allowances for police. Their allowances are not being paid. They are supposed to be there mm -hmm. on paper, but people are not being, pra practically nobody's paying them. Mm -hmm. And even if you look at the way we conduct, we carry out these transfers, Betty, mm -hmm. I have been in the service and I know when you are being posted to places like Mandera, in most cases, mm -hmm. you are being taken there on disciplinary grounds. Can you tell me you will go there and serve? You will not go there and serve. I mean, people are not looking at policemen as human beings who can be sat down and talked to mm -hmm. and agree. I remember during our training and during my service, mm. you tell your commander you are sick, he'll tell you Kazin Adawa. Kazin Adawa. Kazin Adawa. <laughs> What does that mean? <laughs> take, me take medicine and go. And work. you go back to work. Go back to work. <laughs> we are witnessing police officers going out there in the streets, fighting battles with criminals, killing them. And at the end of the day, nobody is managing that stress. Mm. Uh, you go to developed countries. 
once a policeman has been involved in a shootout, this person is withdrawn from duty for a certain period of time. Uh, Two months you're okay. given leave, okay. you are disarmed, you are taken for th therapy. I mean, to put you back in your right sense of mind. Okay. But here in Kenya, you walk from one killing to the next. Nobody is bothered. And we'll be talking about the therapy because that was one of the issues. Yeah. Richard, you want to add on uh, that? Uh, uh, I, 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 I think what I had raised earlier, mm -hmm. that let us, look into the, uh, let us look into this aspect of what I called revolution in military affairs in totality. Mm -hmm. The problem as a country is that we want to exercise revolution in military affairs as tokenism. That you say that you have bought APCs, then you have modernized the police, okay. then you leave it as such. Mm -hmm. But when we talk of revolutionary military affairs, it involves almost four things, mm -hmm. which you cannot say that you, you apply it selectively. It involves the aspect of weaponry. How are, what are the weapons that the police have nowadays? Are they weapons that give them advantage over and above the weapons that uh, the, criminals the criminals have? have? How are the APCs? Are they giving them added advantage more than what the Al-Shabaab has, for instance. Mm -hmm. How are the guns now? Are they still the guns that are of the 21st century? Or are they the guns of the 15th century? What about bulletproof vest? Those are the weapons. Then you look at the aspect of training. Are they being trained to deal with the 21st century's challenges? Yeah. Or are they still being trained to deal with the 15th century uh, challenges? The colonial training mm -hmm. for program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with, with, revolution, uh, Betty, with the revolution in military affairs, we don't even nowadays need to look at uh, that uh, you have 32 uh, teeth, that, that, that you are physically fit. Those are, those are the thinking of the 15th century. Mm -hmm. So things should Because have nowadays, I don't need to be physically fit in order to in interrogate someone. I don't need to have some physical qualities in, ed in order to carry out some aspect of police work. The other aspect of revolutionary in the military mm -hmm. affairs is that once you have dealt with, once you have dealt with the weaponry, once you have dealt with, with the training, training, there is also that aspect of structure. How is our police structured in the 21st century? Mm -hmm. Is it still structured like it used to be in the 19th century when it was formed? Mm -hmm. Because even though, even if you equip it properly, even if you train the officers properly and the structure is poor, you'll be doing a zero one. When you say structure, maybe you could just explain to us the what does that the mean? Chain of command. The chain okay. of command. Okay. The chain of command. Such that are these commanders are, looking mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. police officers as part of their family? As, okay. That's as a good harmony if, between yeah, yeah, if you go junior to police if, officers. If you, go to Israel, and, mm -hmm. if you go to Israel, a commander is part of the junior's family. You work like a family. Mm -hmm. In Kenya, a commander is a commander is there to give orders. You've been told now we've given you housing in Ruiru, move your family by 28th mm. of June to Ruiru. He's not looking at you as a father. He's not looking to you as a parent, mm -hmm. a family man. Mm -hmm. You have to take care of your children's education. You have to move them. I mean, this is where we are failing. Management in the police is poor. Okay. What we are doing is we are just mass producing police officers, we are not looking at the welfare aspect. All right. We are not looking at the quality. Look at that incident on Langata Road, where police, or me, police officers were struggling with a lady. She was telling them, why are you arresting me? We have the judges' rules. They are very clear. It shows the level of stress in the police. Mm. They feel that a, pol a, a Mwanainji should obey my orders. Yet Mwanainji now have moved to the 20th century. They know their rights. They know their rights. I mean, okay. this is something that we need to mm. look at critically because uh, it's getting out of hand. And these cases of suicide, I mean, we need to treat the police officers. We need to know that these are human beings, functioning human beings. And we should find a way of dealing with these cases of issues of cases of stress in the police. Let's take these policemen through therapy, whether it be prepared even when they are going for operations. Mm -hmm. Nobody prepares the policeman for the kind of terrain and so environment is going to operate in. They get surprised when they, they get They there. get surprised when they get okay. to the ground. I tend to take a different approach mm -hmm. from my, my colleague. Mm -hmm. Is that nobody will, uh, it is very hard sometimes to have a prior, uh, prior, prior know how of a, how an environment mm -hmm. that you are being deployed will look like. Richard, because you know, you, is, you know Baringo. The, mm. this, is, uh, this is not Europe we are going, talking about. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know Baringo. It, and some it, of these commanders it, have even operated it, in those it, areas. It is. Mm -hmm. 
So you prepare Remember operational what? orders. Mm. These operational orders will prepare your people on what they're going to face. But it is not everybody who can wake up and become a police. It's, it's, some of us are civilian. Others become police mm -hmm. officers. There is that tenant that it's required of you in order to become a police. And one of the requirements of, 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 that is required of you in order to, be, to serve in the service is that you can, you can survive all the pressure coming your way. Because remember, uh, a, a battlefield is not somewhere that you go for a catwalk. There is a lot of confusion. There is a lot of chaos in a battlefield. And it is required of anyone who have decided. You know, the problem is various people have got various motives as to why they decide to become police officers. Okay. Some of them don't have these tenants. But because there is an opportunity, in fact, if you look at some of those people who, who decide to become police officers, mm -hmm. some of them should be somewhere in a saloon doing other things. <laughs> and these are the people... <laughs> Yeah, it, 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 it is true. These are the people that if they are confronted, even with a very simple, mm -hmm. with a very simple challenge that they can walk over, they, they, they decide to react differently. For instance, as a civilian, if I'm confronted with a situation, how I will react to that situation is very different from how a police officer should or react. Act. Like, for instance, mm -hmm. it's very rare to, 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 it will be very rare to see police officers who have undergone a training to shed tears, mm. it's, 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 it's something unhappy. Okay, but I want us to talk about something that you were almost disagreeing on, mm -hmm. and it's uh, that structure that uh, you were talking about. When we had this issue to do with Bar uh, Baringo a few, a few months ago, maybe two months ago, mm -hmm. one of the issues that was coming from the ground is that the police did not know, the people who were sent there, they did not know, okay, so what, what are we coming here to do? They were not properly uh, told that when you go there, you know, you'll find kids who are coming to sort of like um, eavesdrop on uh, the plans that you have. Uh, giving them an edge, giving these uh, fighters from the ground an edge. So maybe, I don't know if that's what uh, Msamali wanted to talk about, that structure and information that is given to them. Yeah, that structured information is important, mm -hmm. Betty. And uh, we should agree that policemen are human beings. And you should not tell me that a policeman cannot shed tears. He should. I mean, we are trying to tell, make them uh, Super. superhuman. Uh -huh. And this is what is actually happening now. Not them... We are not accepting that these people can suffer from stress and then we take action to make sure that they get therapy. Mm -hmm. You see, let's treat policemen just as human beings. I remember I'm still suffering from the trauma of Saba Saba. Mm -hmm. I was there. I witnessed what happened. Mm -hmm. When it comes to Saba Saba, I recall what happened those days. It still affects me mm -hmm. as a person. And when we talked about, I'm talking about telling people exactly where they are going and what they're going to do. I was taken to Kayabumbo from Embakasi. I was not told what I was going to do. I was not told the period I was, going to, I was going to stay there. I went and stayed there for four months with only one pair of boots, one pair of trousers. I mean, that and alone is enough to have made Rocket Oso do what he did in Mombasa. Mm -hmm. It was during that period. Mm -hmm. So it's always important that when you are taking people to a place, prepare them. If you are being deployed to work in Nairobi, this is Nairobi, this is a city, you will meet all sorts of people be taken through some kind of training of how to deal with members of the public. We need to avoid scenarios like what we saw on Langata Road because these policemen should accept that they're actually out here to serve the people and that they are also human. Right. I think this is something that mm -hmm. needs to be worked on. All right. Otherwise, we are looking at a police service that is demoralized. We are looking at the police service that mm -hmm. is not being taken care of properly, and this is what exactly is causing part of the stress mm -hmm. among us, the officers. All right. I, I want us to wind up but, uh, by talking about you know, the management that you talked about. Uh, do we have those structures where you know, after a police comes from uh, the battlefield, they are able to be given um, counseling you know, for them to sort of like... Uh, it doesn't happen. I, 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 it I, I, okay, I think let what, me what happens, Richard, uh, what happens is uh, before a police officer, and it is normally a general standard in a uh, disciplined, disciplined organization, is that there is always what you will always hear people talking of being briefed and being debriefed. Mm -hmm. Before you go out for an operation, there is always that aspect of being briefed. Yes. And being briefed means that what to go and do in case of what, what to expect, and how to respond to likelihood scenarios that your commander creates both real and imagined. Mm -hmm. Then once you are through with an operation, there is always that aspect of being, some people will call it being demobilized or being debriefed, whereby now you come back. I think this is the, the most important 
uh, the most important uh, uh, exercise, whereby the commander who is involved now should now come in, what will form part of the debriefing. So that if there, was, there is somebody who may have experienced a lot of challenges, mm -hmm. this person, the debriefing should be tailored to meet the challenges that this officer mm -hmm. may have encountered on the ground. And I think mm -hmm. what is very important in all this is to create an enabling environment. And this one is squarely. Even if we have good, uh, good books on the same, mm -hmm. good laws on the same, yeah. and, unless, unless we reintroduce what I would call hygiene, unless we deworm uh, our commanders in terms of their thinking, that they should now think in terms of the 21st century commanders, whereby you look at your troops as, you are, as, as part of your family. In fact, let me give you a very good example. Mm -hmm. For instance, in Israel, if you are a commander, there can't be a commander who lives a battlefield if he cannot account for all his officers. But here we have a scenario whereby a commander can leave a battlefield mm -hmm. Even when he cannot say where some of his officers are, which is unheard of in ideas. Okay. So these are the things that we need to reintroduce. Right. That as a commander, when you look at your officers, don't look at them from the point that, like for instance, what uh, uh, my friend talked about, that Kazi Nidawa. Mm. No. And these are why you will see that most of the officers now, they are looking at their commanders as if they are their enemies. Their enemies. Okay. And this Final should, this, thoughts, this should be extended to the families. Okay. We are not looking at the families of the police officers. When we are making decisions at the top, we don't look at these people as family men. Today you are in Mandera, tomorrow you have been transferred to Bungoma. Three years down the line you have been moved elsewhere. Are we looking at these families? We are breaking up families. And I think seriously this is what is bringing stress mm -hmm. in the police service and it needs to be handled and handled properly. All right. The debriefing uh, my friend Richard is talking about is never done. It's never done. Never done. Never done. You come from the operation area, it's over. <laughs> Move back to your but station. Even the commander continue, himself. Continue with your daily routine. He is not briefed. Even yeah. the commander himself. You come from so a killing like that, you? like that, like that, uh, is silly cop. Everything back okay. to normal. Okay. Nothing happens to you. Right. So it builds up in you. Mm. And then at the end of the day, you have to vent it somewhere. So what happens? You kill your colleagues, you kill yourself. I think wow. this is serious. It needs to be handled properly. Better. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your time. Richard Tutta, he's an homeland uh, expert, security expert. And uh, we also had George Musamali, who's also a security expert. Thank you for your time.